Okay, the kingdom of God. Here we go. Make sure I'm turned on here. Yes, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Now, who can tell me what's the greatest sign of Jesus returning? What's the greatest sign of Jesus returning? Is it wars? Is it earthquakes? Is it famines? What's the greatest sign that tells us that Jesus is about to come? Anybody remember? The gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the nations and then the end shall come. And you might say, well, I thought you know, everybody's heard the gospel. Maybe they have, but they might not have heard the gospel of the kingdom. There's a difference between getting your ticket and going to heaven, getting a fire insurance policy, and actually receiving a kingdom and ruling and reigning in life through the one Jesus Christ. You know, it says, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Many believers think this is all about going to heaven when we die, but it's not. It's about ruling and reigning in life. Now think about it. Adam was never supposed to die. Adam and Eve were supposed to live on this planet perpetually and increase and increase and increase. Mankind was going to, the family of mankind would grow bigger and bigger. And so God's kingdom would come on this earth and would rule and reign through his family. And how many know God doesn't change his mind? When God sets something in order in the book of Genesis, the law of first mention, it stays. When God said, I give you dominion, power, and authority to subdue, then God meant us to subdue on this earth. Now, just for those that get a bit concerned, we do go to heaven. Amen. Mainline Bible teaching says that we go to heaven probably for a seven-year period, the marriage supper of the, lion, of the Lamb, but then we come right back. Jude tells us that he comes with ten thousands of his saints all dressed in white, and that's us coming back with Jesus, what? To rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. So really, it's not so much about thinking about spending eternity in heaven as it is spending millennium down here on the earth, I mean, training for reigning. And so we really need to get that kingdom mindset. Otherwise, we just hang out at the rapture bus stop, waiting for our redemption to draw near so we can get out of this big bad world. But Jesus says, no, I've placed you in this big bad world to change it. I've called you to be the salt and to be the light, to do purity conferences and things like that, to change people's lives. And it's interesting, Anna, that you mentioned about power being the answer, because God's kingdom is all about power. In fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians 4 tonight. 1 Corinthians 4.20. Ready? Read. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Now, that word power in the Greek is the word dunamis or dunamis. And it literally means miracle working power. So it's not talking about moral power. It's not talking about the power of a godly life as such. It's talking about the explosive miracle working power, the same power that Jesus used when he raised the dead, when he cleansed the lepers, when he healed the sick and opened blind eyes. So the kingdom of God is not about just in word, but it's in power. Amen. It's in a demonstration of his power. And praise God, you and I have been chosen to host that power and to see signs and wonders and miracles happen uh, through that power in our lives. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, when it, people were drawn to Jesus by, the, by multitudes, weren't they? They came to him by the thousand. Why? Because they were attracted to the demonstration of the power of God. There's plenty of other good teachers around at that time, but there was something different about Jesus. His words had authority because when he spoke, something happened. And so people are attracted to power. Is that a bad thing? Sometimes we think if people are attracted to power, that that's not a good thing. But that is a good thing because God made us that way. God created us to be powerful people. God created us to have that life transforming power emanating from our beings. He didn't create us to be powerless. He didn't want us to be at the mercy of our circumstances all the time. He didn't want to be under the circumstances. No, he wanted to be, us to be over the circumstance, to be mountain movers, so he gave us power. So when man lost power, it was only natural that when power was in demonstration through another man, that people would be drawn to that. And we understand, don't we, that Jesus was not in a class of his own as such. He was the first born of many brethren. And so he came not as God manifested in the flesh, operating in the power of God. He came as a man, Jesus of Nazareth, anointed with the Holy Spirit. And that's important for us to know, because if, if he came in a different way, 
then we can never hope to attain to the works of Jesus. And yet Jesus said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these. And so there is a craving, and there should be a craving in our life for power. And that's not a bad thing. That's not something to be ashamed of. That's something to celebrate. Amen. If we lost something, then we should get it back. If we lost power in the garden, then we need that power back. If we lost dominion and authority in the garden, then we need it back. If we lost provision and we lack things, well, we need that provision back. You know, why did people come to Jesus? Because they saw him heal sickness and disease. They saw him open blind eyes. They saw him overcome lack. You know, what happened when they needed to get a coin to pay the tax? Peter, go and catch a fish. You'll find a coin in its mouth overcame lack. What happened when they didn't have enough to feed 5,000? Little boy's lunch. Jesus blessed it. It increased. See, people saw that demonstration of power, the power to increase material things, the power over sickness and disease, even the power over death. Amen. And that's what the kingdom is about. It's a kingdom of power. And I know this is dis dif different to what we've heard in the past about, you know, live a, live a good life and just do the best you can and he who endures to the end will be saved. But it's not about that. It's about God's kingdom now. If it wasn't, God would not have told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If it was all about the sweet by and by and we all get healed when we go to heaven, he wouldn't have told us to pray that way. He would just say, pray for strength that you make it to the end. And when you get to heaven, I'll heal you. No, he didn't say that. He said, no, your kingdom come and your will be done. That means if there's sickness, it should be healed. Amen? Amen? If there's disease, it should be healed. If there's lack, then there should be prosperity. Amen? If there's sin, there should be righteousness. If there's darkness, there should be light. And so it's, this, this book is a book about kingdoms. Amen? It's, it's not a religious book. And since we've been doing this series, I've been reading this book through different eyes. You know, think about the, the announcement of the baby Jesus into the earth. Was he announced as a priest or a king? king of the Jews. He was announced as a king, wasn't he? King of the Jews. When he was going through that trial before the cross and with Pilate and everything like that, he, you know, Pilate said, are you a king? And he basically said, yes, I am a king. But my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another realm. It's from an invisible realm. He said, that's why I'm not sending men out to fight for me. Because it's not about this physical realm. It's about an inbreaking of a powerful, invisible realm to affect things in this natural realm. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, let's um, come over to 2 Corinthians 5. So we can get where I want to go tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, around about verse 20. 2 Corinthians 5. That great verse in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And uh, verse 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Anybody heard much of that word ambassador? What does that conjure up when you think of the word ambassador? Any ideas? What's, what's an ambassador? What do they do? They represent something, don't they? An ambassador represents a kingdom or a country where they came from, but they're not a citizen in that country. They're in another country, but they're representing the country in which they have citizenship or they're representing the kingdom which they come from, all right? So you and I, our citizenship is in heaven, but we are ambassadors. We are part of God's embassy, which is here on planet Earth. Amen. And our message is what? It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's not our own message. You know, the thing about an ambassador is they would never, ever give their own opinion about a matter. They would always faithfully represent the rule and the law of the place where they came from. They would never put their own opinion in there. That's just not the way things work. And so, you know, in a kingdom, the word of the king is absolutely supreme. It's absolutely supreme. It's all that matters. 
really at the end of the day, with respect, your opinion and my opinion doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It really doesn't matter. It has some value one to another as we express opinions. But in the kingdom of God, the only thing that matters is the word of the king. The word of the king is absolutely supreme. And you and I can argue about the word of the king till we're blue in the face and all we'll have at the end of the day is blue faces. It just doesn't matter. Okay, so now I, I was reading in Miles Monroe's book, and I'll quote some of it later, but he was talking about the fact that, you know, in the West here, many of our countries are, are what we call democracies. Using some big words tonight, but democracy. We're a democracy. In other words, we have people power, all right? We vote in who we want for our leader. We vote who we want to lead us. We vote over certain important issues. And even in local council and stuff like that, we get to vote. We get to vote about a number of things. You can join a local school board and you can get to vote. And so in our culture, we're used to democracy. Now, democracy was a man-made thing. Okay, Democracy did not come out of the Bible as such, although there are some godly things to democracy, such as human rights and freedom of speech and things like that. There's some good stuff. But democracy came from ancient Greek philosophy. Okay, the Greek philosophers, you know, the Greek kingdom before Christ came. That's where democracy comes from. Okay, it's about people's power, people's opinions matter, and people get to vote who they want to lead them. But, you know, it's hard for us in the West because we have this democratic mindset. It's very hard for us in some ways to embrace the kingdom of God because God's or the, the word of the king is absolutely supreme, whether we like it or not. The word of Jesus Christ is absolute authority for us. It doesn't matter if we don't like it or not. And see, what we tend to do, and I'm not talking about us necessarily, but we, you know, that big group of we, what we tend to do sometimes is, is form a committee, do we not? And we get together with like-minded people who have certain opinions that, that synergize, and, and we, can, we make an informal committee. Even in church, sometimes that can happen. You know, the pastor might say something or something's read from the word and somebody gets upset and they will begin to, to form an informal committee. They wouldn't call it a committee, but they'll get a group of people together. So, hey, I don't think much about that. You know, that tithing business, we don't, we don't practice that in the New Testament, do we? And they'll form an informal committee and taking to an extreme, they'll end up voting with their feet, sometimes leaving the church. What is that? That's democracy. That's the culture of today, but it's not submitting to kingdom rule. Okay, And I, I especially, it just really, um, this week as I was thinking about this, and, and I've said this to people, you know, when we transition from new market to here, I always tell people, you know, it's, it's the Tongan people that came through. It's the Tongan people that mainly came through. And I've always said to people, it's the, the, they're so loyal. And I left it at that. And then, but I, I began to understand this week, it, it's... It's loyalty in the context of kingdom. Because Tongan people understand something about kingdom. You have a king. And you know when the king decrees something, it's, it's done, isn't it? We, we better just change our minds right then if we don't agree with what the king said. You see? And so I want to commend you because your kingdom mindset helped you to go through a very difficult period and just hook up with the words of Jesus. Amen? Other people voted with their feet democratic mindset. No, we don't like this new venture. We don't like this new outreach thing you're doing. We don't um, like this hope center thing necessarily. We like churchianity. And so democracy, people voted with their feet. See, Miles Monroe said it's very hard for democratic minded people to embrace the things of the kingdom of God. I remember years ago I did a series and my wife probably, I think she used to tell me that was her favorite one called Kingdom Confrontation. <laughs> and I knew that series would stir some things up because, man, we, we were just going to confront mindsets with what the Word of God says. And we lost some people. We lost some people because people thought it was being like, you know, autocratic. Like, man, you're, you're being too black and white. You're just declaring the Word of God as it is. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus had the audacity when he arrived on the scene to tell everybody, You've got the wrong thinking. You're going to have to change your thinking to receive what I've got for you. I mean, imagine, imagine John Key standing up on election night, God, and, and, and telling the whole country, you've got a wrong mindset. I'm going to change your thinking. 
Well, there'd be an election the next day, wouldn't there? <laughs> Democratic mindset, but in the kingdom. No, Jesus said, hey, your thinking's wrong. You're going to have to change it completely. You're going to have to repent to receive this kingdom that I've just brought. You see, now, a lot of democratic people don't like that, do they? Who do you think you are telling me that my thinking's wrong? Bless God, I know how I think. My grandpa used to think the same thing. Well, who cares? Who gives a rip what grandpa thought? What about what Jesus said? Amen? See, this is kingdom stuff. You see? The kingdom is not a, the kingdom and democracy do not mix. That doesn't mean democracy is evil. Like I said, some parts of democracy are fine. But we've got to understand we've got one king. His name is Jesus. And what he says goes every time, whether we like it or not. If we don't like it, we have to make the adjustment because guess what? He's not going to change. Now, Job found that out, didn't he? Job had 42 chapters to repent. <laughs> Job didn't understand what was happening to him. He didn't understand that he'd let his hedge down through fear. And so he got this warped idea that God had some deal going with the enemy and that God was allowing all this stuff to happen. And he started accusing God and this, that and the other thing. And, and but in, in Job 42, we read that Job repented. He said, I've uttered things about God, which were too wonderful for me. I did not understand. So now I repent in dust and ashes. As soon as God heard those words, God increased Job twofold. See, so God's not the one that's going to adjust. We're the one that's going to have to change our thinking. And when we come in line, when we repent and get in line with kingdom, then increase starts to happen. Amen. So let's just quote a little bit from Miles Monroe. He's got some great stuff in this book. Awesome book. Now he, um, he quotes here from Luke 22, verse 29. And this is, a, this is a kingdom statement. He says, And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me. Okay, I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me. That's what Miles Monroe says. He says, this statement is always used at the appointment of an official representative of a government to other nations. This is the position of an ambassador. This is not a religious designation, but a governmental one. Interesting, eh? And so Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, I confer on you the same kingdom that my father conferred on me. In other words, you are now an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. You now have power to decree and to declare what the king says. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And so it helps us stop reading the Bible as a religious book and as a kingdom book. Yeah, Remember it said in Isaiah 9, I think it is, it talks about wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. See, it's, there's a lot of kingdom talk. Now, I, I told you um, that the word kingdom is, is, is written 150 times in the New Testament. Now, 119 times in the Gospels alone. So 119 of the 150 is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So I'm encouraging you to read the Gospels if you want to find out more about kingdom. You'll get some out of Acts and the Epistles, but most of the kingdom talk is Jesus when he was talking in the Gospels, all right? Okay, so here's some things, uh, some characteristics of an ambassador, okay, who you and I are. You're sitting next to an ambassador tonight, somebody very important. Number one, appointed by the king, not voted into position, all right? Praise God that we did, you didn't have to wait for somebody to vote you in. Someone to see if you were good looking enough or intelligent enough or... Uh, qualified enough? No, you were appointed by Jesus himself, not voted into a position. That's a good thing because if you could be voted in, you could be voted out. But you weren't. Jesus appointed you. Appointed to represent the state or the kingdom. In this case, you're appointed to represent the kingdom of heaven. Uh, an ambassador is committed only to the state's interests. Okay. Now, Adam was doing fine in the garden until he got other interests, wasn't he? He got interested in a fruit tree, which shouldn't have interested him because he had a lot of other trees to eat from. But he committed high treason and he lost his appointment. Um, in, an ambassador embodies the nation state or the kingdom. Now, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. 
Okay, so you are the embodiment of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, an ambassador is totally covered by the state. You notice when the ambassadors, I think the Chinese ambassador was on the news just last night. You notice how their offices always look really nice. They always drive some really nice cars. Why? They're looked after by the home state. And so with us, if we're ambassadors of, of heaven, guess what? We're, we're covered by the state. We're looked after. An ambassador is the responsibility of the state. Jesus takes personal responsibility for you. Uh, an ambassador is totally protected by his government. Remember, we've got angels, we've got an army in this kingdom. An ambassador never becomes a citizen of the state or kingdom to which he is assigned. That's an interesting thought. Remember, I told you I'm a citizen of Great Britain, but I'm not a citizen of New Zealand, so I can relate to that. An ambassador can only be recalled by the king or the president. An ambassador has access to all his nation's wealth for assignment. Oh, I love that. <laughs> We've got some assignments coming up, haven't we? Myanmar and Russia. Praise God, there's, there's, that's covered, isn't it? That's covered. It's an assignment, kingdom assignment. See, don't think of your nine to five job as a job. Think of it as a kingdom assignment. It's not your, it's not your source of income. No, it's an assignment. Jesus Christ is your source of income. Now you're there on assignment. He's got things for you to do whilst you're there from nine to five. An ambassador never speaks his personal position on any issue, only his nation's official position. Interesting, isn't it? You know, like they questioned the, the uh, Chinese ambassador last night. What do you think about this Crafer, was it Kramer, Crafer, Crafer Farms deal? Everyone's going on about in the news. He, he just kept his mouth shut. He said, I don't think anything about it. I'm not going to talk about it at all. He's not there to give his own opinion. He's there to represent China. He's there to represent the government of China. He wouldn't dare say anything that his prime minister has not spoken first. And so with us, it's not about what we think. It's about what the word of God says. And lastly, an ambassador, his goal is to influence the territory for his kingdom government. Influence the territory for his kingdom government. You know, in, in, in our kind of setup here, we have a, we have a governor general, don't we? And what's he? He's the, he's the representative of the Queen of England. He represents the kingdom, who the Queen of the kingdom in New Zealand. And our Prime Minister has to submit to him. He has to present what he's going to do, his plan or his vision, has to be submitted to the Governor-General to see if it's in line with what the Queen of England has decreed for the Commonwealth of Nations. You see, so there's a chain of command there. Praise God. So we're ambassadors. Hallelujah. So we've got to, yeah, it's, it's really important that we, um, we develop this kingdom mindset. Okay, you know, like you said, it's, it's hard for someone with a democratic mindset. It's really hard for them to enter into God's way of doing things, God's way of thinking. Why? Because I'm always thinking about my comfort, my rights, my opinion. You know, it's my rights, my, my voice matters. Well, it does if you're saying what God says. Amen. Now, many times, um, many of the statements that Jesus made are kingdom statements. He said, I only say what my father says. That is, a, that is an ambassador. That is a kingdom ambassador speaking. He said, I only say what my father says. I only do what I see my father doing. He says, my father is working until now. Therefore, I'm working. Okay, you see that connection? He is hardwired to the kingdom of God, if you like. He wouldn't dare do anything. He said, no, he said, I, I've got to go and preach the kingdom in other cities also. I'd like to stay here and heal more sick people, but my father says it's time to move to the next city because they've got to hear the kingdom message too and things like that. So it's not, even sometimes good things can be an enemy of the kingdom of God. No, we're, we're at the mercy and the call of our father, of our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the king of kings. We submit ourselves to him in every single thing. That's why it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. You know, you know as well as I do, you can spend your life seeking after things, trying to get it all together. It just doesn't seem to work, does it? 
But if we seek the King of Kings, we seek first his kingdom, his mandate, his purpose for our life. We find this provision. We find this connection. We find this relationship. We find things just happen, seem to fall into line and things like that. So the kingdom way is the only way. And as the church, we're going to have to come in line with that. Because he said this gospel of the kingdom is the gospel that's going to usher in the second coming of Christ. Amen. And so really it's up to the church when Jesus comes back. No one knows the day or the hour, but we can determine the season. If we get off our blessed assurance and start preaching this kingdom message that, hey, it's not just about getting saved and going to heaven. It's about power to live. It's about power to overcome. It's about power to get healed. It's about power to be made whole. It's about power to raise the dead. Amen. Amen. And this world is looking for power. Right. They're not looking for religion. They're looking for power in all the wrong places. And so they might come to church for a couple, get saved, pray the prayer, come to church for a few months. And if all they're taught is religion, guess what? They're going to go back out into the world because they're looking for power, self-help and things like that. And we've got the message. Right. Amen. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's all the power you need. <laughs> but we've been afraid to talk about power in the church a lot of times, haven't we? You know, we talk about this false humility thing and we majored on character. We haven't talked so much about the power. But we need to talk about the power of God because this kingdom is not just in word, but it's in power. And people need power. People need power to overcome their financial deficits. They need power to overcome their dying of cancer. They need power to overcome their marriage that's breaking up. Amen. They need power to overcome their relationships that are damaged. That's the kind of power that people need. And we've got that message. We have a message of power. Come to Jesus and he'll give you all the power that you're ever going to need to fix your situation. You start decreeing what Jesus decrees and you'll find that power working in your life. And that's our message. And I think in the word of faith, we're halfway there because we know how to declare some things, but we've got to bring it in a kingdom context and not a church context because this is about God's kingdom and God's will being done on earth. That's an exciting message. And like I said, we're going to keep sharing this week after week. Repetition is good because we've got to get this. And as Tongans, you're halfway there. You understand some things about kingdom, but some of us democratic thinking people, it's going to take us a little longer. <laughs> but we're going to get it. Amen.